excitement, drama, friendship, violence, and dogs. Lots and lots of dogs. What more could you wish for in an anime series? Hi, I'm Miles Dave Baxter, and I'm here to talk about the anime series Silverfang, also known as Ginga Nagarabushi Gin. It's one of my favorite things ever, staying with me ever since I saw it as a kid, and it no doubt contributed heavily to my love of animated animal characters. I should warn you that there will be some graphic imagery and a few spoilers. With that out of the way, let's get started. Ginga Nagarabushi Gin is Japanese for Silverfang Shooting Star. In Norway, Sweden and Denmark it was simply called Silverfang. And in Finland it was called Hopianuoli. Hopianuoli. Hop Hopianuoli. Hopianuoli. In this video I'll be calling it Silverfang. Silverfang is an anime series about a puppy named Gin, which is Japanese for silver. Setting the mood for the series is one of the coolest animation intros you'll ever see. The first episode starts off with Gin being born, promptly seeing his own father getting murdered by a bear, and an old man amputating his own leg. The bear isn't just any bear, but the evil Akakabuto, who has been terrorizing the local mountain populace. Akakabuto lost his eye to a bear hunter, and the incident also damaged his brain so he's incapable of hibernating. The lack of proper rest makes Akakabuto increasingly aggressive and dangerous. Through the first arc of the show, we follow Gin and his owner Daisuke, as well as local bear hunter Gohe, who puts Gin through some rigorous and dangerous training, also known as animal abuse. They're all set on taking Akakabuto down, whatever the cost. Eventually, Gin encounters a pack of wild dogs who are also out to get rid of Akakabuto. And this is where the show takes an interesting turn. For the first time we hear Gin speak, and the focus shifts from following the humans in the village, to following Gin as he decides to join them. Gin travels with the pack through Japan to try to recruit the best and the strongest dogs to join them in their fight against the Great Bear. Meanwhile, Akakabuto is only growing stronger and meaner. While admittedly it might sound a bit silly, it all comes together to create an exceptional anime. You really get to connect with Gin, Daisuke, and several of the other characters, and you feel with them in their struggles. There's drama and real consequence, and you never know whether a character will make it through. The music is excellent, helping to underscore the melancholy of the tragic moments and getting you pumped up during the action scenes. <laughs> The animation is excellent too, except for maybe that one episode. As is the case with a lot of anime, Silverfang started out as a manga comic book. Drawn and written by Yoshihiro Takahashi, the manga began its run in 1983 in Shonen Jump, Japan's leading manga anthology for boys. This is where a lot of popular mangas have started out, such as Naruto, One Piece, My Hero Academia, and many more. The 21 episode anime adaptation aired in Japan in 1986. And in 1987, the manga won the coveted Shogakukan Manga Award for Best Shonen Manga. Since then, Silverfang has spawned sequels, prequels, and spin offs. In 2019, there was even a professional stage production of the original series. While Silverfang has undeniably done well in its home country, it remains fairly obscure globally. That is, except for in the Nordic countries. In the late 80s, Silverfang was dubbed and released in Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, and Finnish. Sorry, Iceland. The 21 episode anime was condensed into four separate volumes of roughly 90 minutes each, and was initially only available through VHS rental stores. 
Back then, there were limited venues for getting your fix of cartoons. The internet had yet to hit the mainstream, and in the Nordic countries, many households only had access to the publicly owned TV channel, which generally focused on children's entertainment that was gentle, educational, inoffensive, and overall not too exciting. Thankfully, we did have VHS rental stores, which often had an eclectic offering of entertaining cartoons. When I was a kid, going to the rental store with my family became a weekend tradition and always something to look forward to. While they would rent some boring live-action film for themselves, I would get to rent cartoons. It was always exciting browsing the shelves, looking at the box art, seeing what was available, and making my pick. And this is where I discovered Silver Fang. I was mesmerized, glued to the TV. The series was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, and I absolutely loved it. Renting and rewatching each of the four volumes multiple times. Apparently, others had a fondness for Silver Fang as well, as it was eventually released on home video, both on VHS and DVD. But while the show saw some popularity in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, it was nothing compared to Finland. In Finland, they've not only released the Silverfang anime, but also translated and published the original manga, as well as the sequels and various spin-offs. In fact, when I visited Finland last summer, they actually had three new volumes available at the local supermarket. Because of this popularity, the author Yoshihiro Takahashi has been to Finland two times so far, doing public events, as well as being a guest of honor at Finnish anime conventions, and even being interviewed on Finnish TV. Finland also has a pretty active fan community. In 2012, the Finnish Silverfang fan club was formed. They publish a magazine twice a year and generally try to create engagement. In 2016, they also started hosting GingaCon. It's a smaller convention dedicated to anime and manga, with, of course, a focus on all things Silverfang. There has even been an amateur musical stage play adaptation put on by fans, which has been performed at several Finnish conventions. It premiered in 2011, and maybe it's what inspired the Japanese stage play production, which premiered almost 10 years later. Silverfang has clearly become a part of Finnish popular culture. While I would say it's well-liked and somewhat known in Denmark, Norway and Sweden, and according to these DVD covers, it is actually Sweden's most sold anime. It is considered more niche, and not something you can expect everyone to have been exposed to. Unlike Finland, or you can walk into a regular supermarket to buy the latest manga. As for why Silverfang has had such an impact on this one Nordic country, it's hard to say. There is actually a thread on the Ginga board forum, where people have been discussing this very question. Go give it a read if you're curious. But regardless of the reason, I do think that it is pretty cool. When Silverfang was released in the Nordic countries, it was, of course, dubbed, with uh, varying results. <laughs> While I do have a soft spot for the Norwegian dub, I will admit that it is a bit of a mixed bag, especially in the first volume, where you will have lovely moments with tenderness and subtlety like this. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have moments like this. <laughs> but for the remaining volumes, we get an entirely different and more professional cast, with voice actors who have done work on both Disney and Studio Ghibli films, where the bar is set pretty high. The one slight issue is that they only seem to have three or so actors divided among several dozen characters. While they do a good job of coming up with different voices, you do notice that some characters can sound a bit too similar. As for why the cast is suddenly changed after the first volume, we can only speculate. Maybe some recordings were lost or damaged. Maybe they had financial or scheduling issues. I would love to find out the real reason why, 
but I fear that the answer will be lost to history. Like the real identity of Jack the Ripper, or why the baby Looney Tunes are sometimes wearing diapers and sometimes naked. There is also a second Norwegian dub. It was done for the DVD release of the uncut version, some 20 years after the original. But this dub is very painful to watch. Or listen to, rather. Firstly, the voice work isn't that great. But more importantly, you can hear the Japanese voices in the background. Röde tiger, är det virkelig hundkött? Det är inte möjligt. Du töjser med oss? Nej, töjser inte. Stans! Där är en fälle! Så du det, Heidi Toshi? Jag klarte det! My best guess is that they didn't have access to the proper audio recordings from the studio, where the dialogue would have been on a separate track and could have easily been removed. So instead, they lower the volume when someone is talking. Fortunately, you also get the original Japanese voices with subtitles, which is how most people would want to watch the uncut version anyway. As was mentioned earlier, the 21 episode anime was condensed into four separate VHS volumes of around 90 minutes each. So for the original dubbed release from the 80s, they actually cut about three hours worth of footage. In the fourth and final volume, this becomes especially obvious, as they omit entire episodes and it ends up feeling very rushed. It's hard to fully make sense of everything that's going on and you have characters mysteriously disappearing and teleporting. Even as a kid, I felt something was off and consequently it ended up being the volume I would rent the fewest times. I believe most of the footage was cut to reduce the length. Dubbing and releasing all 21 episodes would have required at least a couple more volumes and would have no doubt increased production costs while probably decreasing audience retention. Getting your audience to rent and watch four different volumes of your obscure Japanese dog cartoon show is already a big ask. But some footage was definitely cut due to its graphic nature. For example, there's this memorable and dramatic scene that I briefly mentioned at the start, where Gohei is trapped with his dog Ricky, Gin's father, and he amputates his own leg. In the dubbed version, he hugs Ricky and it cuts to Akakabuto attacking. While in the uncut version, Gohei amputates his own leg, hugs Ricky, then force feeds his own leg meat to the unsuspecting dog. <laughs> While it's a bit tamer, I don't really feel like I missed out. The dubbed version I grew up with still had plenty of drama, blood and awesome fight scenes. Like the scene you're currently watching. can't talk about the Nordic releases without mentioning the cover designs. In Japan, the first VHS volume had this awesome cover design, showing most of the recurring characters with the menacing giant Akakabuto at the very top together with a couple of his other bear allies. This design was also used for some of the first VHS releases in the Nordic countries, so it has a special nostalgic value for both myself and many others. That's maybe why it was reused for later DVD release but with a few changes. The most glaring change is that they chose to give Gin an angry frown. It does not look particularly good and it's not an expression he ever makes in the show. They also didn't do a great Photoshop job, as you'll also notice that his scar has gotten a bit longer, the patches of white fur on his forehead have started melting slightly, and the irises and pupils of his eyes are no longer round. Another change from the original design is that Akakabuto is gone from the top making way for the title. Instead, he's smaller and off to the side. But this is actually not Akakabuto at all, but just a pretender, as they gave one of the smaller bears from the original design a makeover to make it look like Akakabuto. Looking at the sky at the top, you'll also see that the colors don't quite match. Like there are two conflicting skies. This is especially odd considering that the sky looks just fine and consistent in the booklet that came with the release. Sadly, the frowning gin was reused for the Finnish DVD release of the uncut series. Poor, poor gin. Poor, angry, frowning gin. The design was also used for this later DVD release, 
and it's overall looking a lot better. There's no frowning in, Akakabuto is back at the top, and the sky appears to be on fire. The cover is a lot sharper looking, which is because it has been traced over the original, allowing them to be more flexible with the resolution and getting a cleaner image from modern day standards. But some of the details and subtlety of the original artwork has gotten lost in the process. Which you'll notice if you look at Gohei and Hidetoshi at the bottom of the cover. And presumably for the sake of image composition, most of the dogs have been mirrored. This is something you can never do with asymmetrical characters. Because now we have Gin's scar going the wrong way, Ricky's scar is on his right side rather than his left side, and Black Tiger is suddenly missing his left eye rather than his right eye. It's a bit frustrating since this cover is so close to looking pretty decent. There are also a number of covers with more original designs, most of which don't look all that great, and a few of which you've already seen through this video. There's not really that much to say about these, so I'll just let you enjoy a brief montage. But especially notorious are a certain set of Danish VHS covers. They are unfortunately also very difficult to find, both when it comes to physical copies and higher resolution digital scans. But with some help from friends, I was able to get my paws on one of them. So here you have Daisuke and Baby Gin enthusiastically driving a snowmobile, with an older version of Gin jumping out in front of it, and Gohei and Akakabuto looking on in astonishment. A few things worth noticing is that Akakabuto has two eyes, Gohei appears to have a giant tooth, and that slightly older Gin is likely about to get hit by the snowmobile. But I do love how happy Daisuke and Baby Gin look on this cover. The cover appears to be based off of this previous design, which was used on several other releases in the Nordic countries. And it looks pretty good. Why they didn't just use this design, I don't know. Maybe they didn't have the rights? Or maybe the original source design had gotten lost. Except if you look at the back of the cover, two of the images are actually from the cover design that they're copying, and not from the actual show. Which I guess means that they had the design and had the rights to use it, but instead chose to make a new version? Well, I'm glad that they did. As are Daisuke and Baby Gin. So that's Silverfang. A globally little-known series that oddly enough became a bit of a hit here in the north. If it wasn't obvious by now, I love this series. And there's definitely a lot more that could be said about it. I barely touched on the story and the characters, didn't say too much about the manga, and I probably could have kept on talking about those cover designs. Perhaps I'll make more Silverfang videos in the future. So be sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, and do all of those good things that will help make sure you don't miss out. I also have a Patreon right now, if you want to show your support and get a few occasional bonuses. Now I've been talking for a while, so how about yourself? Have you seen Silverfang? Did you grow up with it like me? Or did you find out about it through some other way? And if you haven't seen it, do you think you will? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching.